Good morning and welcome to the service this morning. We pray the Lord will bless us as we look into his word. It challenges our hearts and encourages us to see more of the beauty of our Saviour in these wonderful chapters where the Lord reveals through the Old Testament more of himself. Let's just give thanks. Father, this morning we come before you. We do pray now that as we come into seek your word and to understand more of it, that we might have a, a sense of your presence here with us, that your Holy Spirit might work in our hearts and minds, that we might concentrate, that we might be able to focus on uh, what your son has to say, that we might have our hearts and minds opened uh, to change to those things that we need to consider. We thank you for your word and all that is in it. We thank you for the truth of it. We pray that we might just be encouraged to share it with those round about, that any who here might be challenged to understand the love of the Saviour for them. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name, giving thanks. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to look into the uh, book of Mark again, the, the second book of the New Testament in chapter 12. It's a continuation of uh, some of the of Jesus in Jerusalem, some of the questions that he's about to be asked. In his last few chapters before his death, he spends a lot of time showing from Old Testament, and that's the scriptures they had, they didn't have the New Testament, bear in mind, um, of passages that reflect him through the questions that, the, that he was being challenged with. Uh, the, the rulers and the senior people of the Jewish nation are all going to be found in the capital, Jerusalem. Uh, like all these things, quite often in the capital city, you have the people who are not prepared to go out of the outer parts and the boundaries and walk places and get dirty and uh, take the drudgery of going to hear someone in another place. In the capitals and the, 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 the capital cities of any country in Jerusalem was no different then or now. All the best minds, the best lawyers, the people who are in government tend to be there uh, and wouldn't always um, be outside of those boundaries for any other reason uh, than maybe just a bit of time out, but they certainly wouldn't spend a lot of time out of it because that's where their work is. That's where the people who have the greatest uh, understanding and the greatest uh, skills in law and in certainly here with the scriptures, the greatest reputation for skills in discourse and debate would be those who are able to challenge. And it's these people that Jesus is meeting up with in the temple area as we come into in chapter 10. It's no different today. If you go to London, in our, in our country, that's where some of the greatest minds are. Not exclusively, but certainly that's where most of the, great, the best lawyers, the best barristers, uh, the senior leaders of, of religion, uh, the senior leaders of government are all based around the capital. And it would be no different in Jesus' time in Jerusalem. In this section, he identifies those that down the years had abused their position and brought harm on many of God's prophets and reveals that they will set out to kill him. So we'll begin in verse 1 of chapter 12. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another servant and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another and they killed him. And many others beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. 
Have you not even read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected. Uh, sorry. I'll skip to page. Has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought but to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the peril against them. So they left him and went away. Then they sent him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay? Or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her and he died. Nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife shall she be? For all seven had her as wife. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken, because you do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Then one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said. Teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go round in long robes, Love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasure, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Pray the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his word. 
In verses 1 to 12, that we see the, the parable that follows on from last week when the uh, scribes and the senior leaders uh, come and ask and challenge him as he walks in this temple area and question his authority to teach and to dismiss those who bought and sold in the temple. Jesus raised the question of baptism of John. Was it of heaven or men? And puts them in a real quandary about how to reply. They knew that their replies, <clears throat> whatever they said, would put them in a bad light with the people, whichever way they replied. So they decide to decline to answer with words that identify them as unwilling to answer. We see the same very often today. If you watch uh, politicians, they'll answer in ways that don't give any real idea so they don't get caught out. They're being very political about what they say because they don't wish uh, to be made to look fools. The next section in 13 to 17, we see the uh, Pharisees and the Herodians question, the question on taxes, should they pay it or not? Testing the Lord. In 18 to 27, we see the, que the question of the scribes, what is the greatest commandment? In 35 to 37, we see the Lord's question. We see his authority revealed. In 38 to 44, warnings about the scribes, none who appear to have raised questions. And their true greed and the true giving of a widow. This chapter has much to say about values, the value of those in spiritual leadership and what they put on God, on the Messiah, on the son of David, on finance and those who have the rule over them or in the reality, in reality, the lack of values. The value of the one of the scribes who asks about the Ten Commandments and the value he puts in them. The value Jesus gives to the commandments, their priority and their outcomes. The value that put Jesus puts on doing what is right. The value of the widow and what she and the value she puts in God. It starts off with those who steal their master from their master and ends with someone who's prepared to give all to the Lord in this chapter. We see those who give nothing to the one who gives everything. And it sums up the heart of the people involved. We see those in leadership who seek to have it all and fail both the Lord and their people and are rebuked by the Lord. It finishes with one who has nothing in the eyes of the world, and yet she holds nothing back and is commended by the Lord. The first parable is the, that we see is the parable of the, vine, of the vineyard. And this follows on from last week, as we spoke earlier, uh, and comes back to the leaders of the Jewish pe people questioning the authority of Jesus. And they've been silenced by his answer on baptism. He was not going to tell them on what authority he did these things. But as we look over this chapter, we'll see that he gives them all the clues, all the information they need to see his authority. The man who planted the vineyard that we see in this passage had not just done the basics. He hadn't just gone down to the garden center and bought a couple of vines uh, and stuck them in the ground in some spare land he had and handed them over to someone else to look after. The vine is of little use for the first three years, I'm told. <clears throat> and if you're going to turn it into wine, it's probably five years. So it's a long and expensive process to yield any fruit and any value out of it. It can take quite a long time to get any money back for your investment. It's an expensive and risky investment and well worth just doing the basics until the capital is built up to ensure costs are maintained at a minimum. But this man in the parable sets an example as a leader for doing it correctly. No area of the vineyard left to, to the whim of another, but the whole project considered from start to finish. He not only supplies the vines, but he has them planted and ready to tend, which means the ground must have been tilled and the soil checked to make sure the quality is acceptable for growing vines. That requires labor and cost. To ensure the vines are protected from the wind and the animals that may damage them or thieves pinching them, he puts a hedge around, and again, he bears the cost and the labor of planting it. 
In those days, hedges would normally be thorny hedges because getting through would be uh, difficult. To ensure the grapes are, can be harvested and crushed in the best condition, not having to be transported any distance. And so ensuring the best opportunity to maximize the output, he builds a wine press. To make sure that it's fully protected from outside, he builds a tower that allows a good view of the surrounding area and somewhere for the vine dressers to say when necessary, somewhere for safety in attack. He could do no more for the vine dressers that were given the vineyard to tend. They had been given it all, and now they had only to tend the vines until the fruit appears and they can harvest it, giving a portion to the owner as payment and selling the rest on for their livelihood. But first they need to tend the crop and ensure it is looked after according to the needs of the vine and for their own growth. Unfortunately, once the vine dresses are in place and enjoying the fruits of their labor, as the grapes begin to flourish and grow, when the owner sends various people to get payment that is due, they abuse them. We're told they stone some and beat others and kill some. The owner of the vineyard finally decides to send his son, considering that those who are running the vineyard would give reverence to his son and give the honor he is due and give the payment they owe as they meet the heir. The parables sadly takes the opposing view, considering that the owner has, has not and is not likely to return and if they get rid of the sun, then eventually the vineyard will become theirs and the prophet will be all theirs. So they kill the beloved son. Some of the other passages, it, it reveals that the Lord asks what they think of the, what the owner of the vineyard shall do. And these men who drew his son off the property and had, and had him killed. What is theirs by right? They reply that he would destroy, destroy those who would do such a terrible thing, as we see in Matthew's account of the same, of the same passage. You see, the scribes acknowledge that it's wrong and evil, and that one of the one who owns a vineyard has every right to destroy and remove the vineyard from them and give it to another. They recognize the failure of those wicked vine dressers responsible for the growth and care of the vines. Who, who took it out on the sun and those who came to get what he was owed. Now the Lord drives home the point of the parable. Have you not read? These are the scribes who prided themselves in knowledge of the scriptures, and yet they had not applied the passage in the Psalms about the one who would come, be rejected, and would be 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 supreme, was the one standing before them. Psalm 118 verse 22 says, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. The Messiah would come and be rejected. We see in Isaiah 53. We read this morning from Psalm 22 of what meant of him being killed. But as other psalmist highlights, and as Jesus applies to himself, he will become the headstone of the corner, the one that the whole building is founded upon. The one who is lowly and undefiled will be recognized as the supreme one. Above all principalities and powers, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was pointing out to them this was the one they were rejecting. They had rejected the Messiah and had sought and were still seeking to kill the son. The heir of the father for their own benefit. So they could continue to rule over the people in unrighteous ways and put a burden on them with their requirements that they did not keep themselves. Sounds a little familiar to many of these days, doesn't it? We see the same problems down through the years. Nothing has changed. Man has not changed. Sin has not changed. Instead of seeking forgiveness and offering sacrifices, they continue to follow the route that the parable suggests. 
that not only will they be rejected, but that there's the son who is the heir they will kill. The imagery comes from the surrounding fields of Judea, which are good for cultivating vines and would be well-known pictures. The parable reflects a passage in Isaiah in chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, where the writer likens Israel, the nation of Israel, to a vineyard that he has done everything for and asks if there is anything he had not been done for it. And yet, and yet it supplied wild grapes. Isaiah writes, he'll destroy it and take away its defenses and rain because it's failed to grow grapes or acceptable fruit despite all the love lavished upon it. Those who knew the scriptures could not fail to notice the similarity and the outcome because the leaders failed to look after the vines and wild grapes grew. The result was destruction and the nation went into captivity uh, just after Isaiah, after Isaiah had written these things. Have you not read, would ring loud in the ears of those leaders as a stinging rebuke. In human terms, instead of the Lord finding Jerusalem being well judged when he came, there was oppression. Instead of righteousness, he found a cry of distress because of the failure of those in leadership. I was reminded as I thought of these things of the promised land of the children of Israel that they entered into. It was fully stocked and ready for them. They just had to be faithful and remove the people that were in it, spread themselves out over their allotted places under the guidance of God and the hand of God. And when the land was first surveyed, it took two men to carry back a bunch of grapes on a pole that they were that big. But through the years, poor leadership and lack of trust meant that they would be divided as a nation and ignore, harm, or kill the prophets until they went into captivity. We'll see later that the same is about to happen to them again in Jerusalem, as it would be destroyed in AD 70, and Israel would no longer be a nation. The vineyard would be given to another. The Gentiles would be included. Those that would share the gospel of the Savior, the Messiah, who came to earth to pay the price for sin, it would be those who were saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial and resurrection that will be brought into the kingdom of God. It has been given to others at great, at great cost to the son of God, as we remembered, as we met this morning. What a privilege we have as if we're here this morning, don't we? We are part of that new vineyard. We've been given it. What are we doing with it? That was the scribes, the chief priests, and the elders dealt with, and it angered them further. But again, they feared the people. A note that he did not leave the temple area where other occasions, when challenged, he may have left the area. But now it's the scribes who had come to him in the temple courts that left. Jesus was in his rightful place, with no reason not to be there. And he taught the people once again. The place of worship of his father, he was happy to be in, and it was his rightful place. Then he comes up with another question, uh, the giving of tax to Caesar. Again, we see a different set of leaders of the people come to test him at the request of the angered scribes, of the elders and the chief priests. They've been dressed down publicly and were embarrassed, challenged about their understanding of the, script, the scriptures which they would find difficult. Now, the Pharisees, who would not want to pay any tribute to Caesar, as they were God's people and didn't consider themselves to be under bondage to any pagan uh, prince, as they were free people uh, of Jehovah, and the Herodians, those who were servants of the household of Herod, who governed on behalf of Caesar, so had a vested interest in the answer, once again getting together, even though they despised one another for the sake of catching up the Lord. They wanted him to be removed from public freedom for giving offense to either side. They start off with being very complimentary to the Lord about his straight talking without favor to any. And then they raise the question, is it lawful 
to give tribute to Caesar. They're asking him to deal with the law. This is a, the area where the law is well known. See, the Pharisees only hold to the first five books of the Bible as we know it, or the Torah as the Jews would call it. The strict sect of the Jews are still, are still around today that only deal in the Torah. And you can see them, especially if you go to London, they're dressed in black quite often with hat, uh, black hats on uh, and usually bearded. And they still only study these five books and are well regarded by people for it. These books written by Moses and, looked, and they look to apply the rules in various circumstances and expand on it. What they were questioning is, should we give finances of those who are God's people to those who are not? They're looking to trick Jesus into giving an answer that offends either God or Caesar and could be used against him and, and show and prove him to be either unfaithful to God by agreeing to give money to those who are pagans against what they consider the Mosaic law or to offend Caesar, offend Caesar by saying that the money he required should not be given to him. Because that's what many in the Jewish nation thought. They didn't like tax collectors. No one particularly likes a tax collector, I get that, but they particularly didn't like the, the, the Roman ones. There was a tax they had to pay to the temple, which was fine. There were many who thought they should not be uh, giving tax and there would be, had been some insurrections because of it. And the Jewish people who flocked to hear him and held him in high esteem would be offended. If he said it was not lawful to give tax, there would be a good case for going before Pontius Pilate for encouraging some to break the law. Yeah, but the Lord knows their wickedness, shows his understanding of people and what they're trying to do. He has already defined, identified himself as God and has given enough evidence to support it. And yet they try to test the son of God. Verses 18 to 21, he says, is it not written, my house should be called, oh, sorry. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled. But he said, why do you test me? He had proven time and again, he had the answers. And he said he knew their hypocrisy because they paid tax. In some ways they were just seeing if they could get out of it or that he would give them permission. Trying to stir it up with the people. But he is wise. He is the all-wise God, isn't he? And he shows time and time again throughout these passages that we've been reading his wisdom, how he deals with men. A real example to us sometimes in how we deal with one another, how we deal with the people around us. Bring me a denarius that I may see it, he says. Whose image? Caesar's. Guess whose it is. He doesn't make it difficult, does it? He says, if it doesn't, if it belongs to Caesar and he's asking for it, give it to him. Those are the rules. God has put all powers and principalities in place. If that's what they demand, that's what we're due to give. That still applies today. Uh, but he finishes off with, what's God's? Give unto him. To God, the things that are God's. Now, there's a challenge, isn't it? Give to God the things that are God. What are God's? What, is, what belongs to God? Everything. Therein lies a challenge for each one of us. Everything we have, everything we are, everywhere, anywhere we live, any government we have, they all belong to God. Render to God the things that are God's. It's a real challenge for us in our daily lives, isn't it? How do we render to God in our daily lives everything? And they left and marveled at him. I have to say, when I was reading this and thought about it, you do have to marvel at the answer and at how much work is left for us to consider. 
What do we consider of our Savior, of our God? What value do we put upon him? His answer leaves him stunned, and then, like those who questioned him earlier, left him in the temple court to continue his teaching. They had no answer to the wisdom of God. We are called to pray for those in authority and those in government. As long as they're not asking us to, to disobey anything in scripture, then we are to obey them. That may mean there's been people being in very difficult positions and down the years people have been and are today. The passage reminds us that we need to be clear of our understanding as the Lord demonstrates to these groups who are challenging him in the temple court. We need to understand the scriptures. We need to understand those things that have Caesar's those things that are God's. So having failed in to, to trick him and to get him to give an answer that would upset either side, another group come along, the Sadducees, to challenge him. These are the elite of the Jewish nation. They were wealthy, did not hold to the truth of the resurrection, didn't believe in the afterlife. They believe that when you died, your body and soul ended. There was no resurrection or afterlife as far as they were concerned. This was it. There was no eternal state for them in heaven or hell. They would hold to the law of Moses and all that he taught as others did, but not necessarily apply it. These men came with questions about the law, which requires the unmarried brother to marry his brother's wife if he dies, and they are childless. That's interesting. The person who's asked is able to refuse, but uh, will be brought into public humiliation by the widow of his brother for not fulfilling his required duty in raising an heir for the brother. It's interesting. This case, this case may have been based on something that was real. We don't know, but it could just be been theoretical. But his answer leaves him speechless. See, this woman had, had been married to the seven brothers and that was right under law. And then she had died and there was no child to take up the inheritance. And the law was de designed around uh, the, the inheritance. But he accused them of being mistaken, not correctly understanding the information they have at their disposal. Now, if you go into high society and uh, posh people, they do not like being corrected or being told that they don't understand something, especially if they think it's their chosen field. But he accuses them of being mistaken. They err. That's the first thing. Then he says he identifies what they're mistaken in. He says it is the scriptures. Jesus on said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? He identifies that this is scriptures which they would have attested to believing in as the Mosaic law having been given to Moses by God. They understood that for all their position and influence and power and wealth. They still did not understand the scripture and its application. The third thing he says they didn't understand is the power of God, and no one can claim to understand the power of God other than his son. They have no concept of the one who they were dealing with. It's no different today, is it? There are, there's people who have status here on earth, and that gives rise to arrogance about their true position before the living God. These people believed that what they had was because of who they were and were deserving of it a people chosen of God and in the vineyard. They had wrongly considered that the question would highlight the absurdity of life after death because who would be this woman's husband after they had all died? The Lord had already highlighted early, early, uh, earlier in the passages that we read previously, the marriage bond was not to be dissolved here on earth. But here is where they erred in understanding that in the afterlife, the question would not be relevant 
because there was no marriage or giving in marriage in eternity. Life of the soul is eternal. We will have a new body after the resurrection. Thank goodness for that. So the need to carry the family line is no longer necessary or relevant. For those raised to eternal life are sons of God eternally. That's our position this morning. What a joy that is. We are sons of God eternally. These men weren't. And they were trying to figure out how to tr trick the Lord into giving an answer that would uh, show him uncertain of the future or not have an answer to our life. But having dealt with the particular case, he then goes on to deal with the real issue, the lack of faith in the resurrection. Because they would hold the Mosaic law, law, even if they failed to follow it, and the Lord takes them back to the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, and verse 6 and 15, where God spoke to Moses before he returned to Egypt to lead the children of Israel out and onto the promised land. God states to Moses in, from that bush that he is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All who had been all of those who had been dead over well over a hundred years, some over two hundred, and yet because they do not know with understanding the scriptures or have any idea of the power of God, they did not recognize the truth that the Lord highlights here from this passage: that God is the God of the living, not the dead. They're mistaken in their understanding of the law, the difference in application on earth and in heaven. But notice that the end, at the end of that second passage, he says, they are greatly mistaken. He said they were mistaken to start with, but here on afterlife, they were greatly mistaken. They were a long way from understanding that when they died, there was more to come. They would, they would leave openly rebuked because of their lack of knowledge. There are many in this day who will deny the resurrection, say that when we die, that's it. The denier of the power of God to change lives and to change their lives. And once more, Matthew highlights the multitudes who gathered were astonished at his teachings, his teachings, while those who stood round and the leaders were infuriated by it. We told that the Sadducees have been silenced and the Pharisees gather again for a discussion on what to do next. One of the scribes is part of the debate among the Pharisees and is well versed in the law of Moses and recognizes the perfection of the answers that the Lord Jesus Christ gives. It appears that he is genuinely impressed and is minded to understand the answer he has given in the light of the law of Moses he knows well. What's his question? Which is the first commandment of all? Which is the preeminent one? Which is the one that is above all others? You see, the, the, the Sadducees and, the, and the, the Pharisees and all the others had made uh, over 600 laws that didn't, weren't written in Scripture, and many of them. They added to the law. They still are. Each one of the groups represented in the, in the questions had prioritized different laws. Each one of these Pharisees and the Rhodians, the, the, the leaders and the scribes, all had different views on what, what was the most important section of the law. This question would give the opportunity for all these groups to hear the answer to the one who had shown great wisdom in his answers to all of them. And so the outcome would be could be divisive. So we get the answer. One that none is able to keep other than the Lord himself. But it's the requirement of the Holy God, but one that will, all will fail in, and it's reason, it is reason the Son of God is standing in front of them. For all have sinned. God looked down, there is none righteous, not even one. Only the Son of God is the righteous one on earth. 
The first commandment is preeminent for all others to follow, because all others flow from it, Barnes puts. The second is like it because we have a right view of God. Then we have a right view of others. Jesus said the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Take time when you go home to reread that commandment. That's what's expected of a righteous, holy God. And we will all fail. And because of that, he sent his son. That's why Jesus is standing in this courtyard. Because there is none who can keep the law. The law only serves to highlight our faults. To make us know that we're sinners. It's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's death, burial, and resurrection at Calvary that gives us the freedom to come into God's presence. Forgiven. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The first one's impossible. The second one's pretty tough. Love your neighbor as yourself. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of prayer, a lot of time with our Lord to understand the depth of these, of these answers. It's a huge challenge about how we consider one another, how we love those around us. Sometimes we're challenged just by the way we love each other. The scribe answers indicates that the right view of God is found in the Old Testament. And it prepares the mind for faith if correctly understood. He is seeking the truth in his, and, and his correct understanding, the Lord says, he is near to finding it. Unlike the others who were mistaken in their understanding, this one, one scribe, was close to the kingdom of God, the Lord says. He wasn't saved. He wasn't in the kingdom of God but he was going the right way. It's interesting that there are, there are evidences in scripture. We think of John 3, 16. We think of the, 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 the scribe that went to the Lord. We think of him as he asked the Lord what he needs to do. The Lord tells him to be saved. He has to trust in him. There were those in power who sought the Lord in truth. After this, we see none of the groups dare ask him any questions, for they were unable to find fault in any of the replies and only succeed in showing their ignorance of the law and the scriptures. Not even, even the greatest of their debaters with the most knowledge of the law and the scripture comes close to the end of understanding the one who is God. The fifth question comes from Jesus himself. When Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said, by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him badly. The challenge to their understanding of the scripture is, and its application to their present circumstances is brought out by the question Jesus raises here. They acknowledge from the scriptures that Christ is the, that the Christ, the Messiah, would be of the line of David. They knew that. Their consideration was that he would be a man, but now Jesus puts them on the spot. If he's of the line of David and a man, but David refers to him as Lord, then this one would be human and divine. That gives them a question that they are unable to answer because they're greatly mistaken. And they don't know the power of God, truly man and truly God, at the one time. This one man standing in their presence is the divine, truly man and truly God at the same time. This is the Savior we know and love for what he has done at Calvary for us. 
This same Jesus is the one who will put all enemies under his feet as a footstool, including those he was speaking to. <clears throat> it's this same Jesus who will come again to the air to take his own home. Hallelujah. That's a day we're looking forward to. It should be. And eventually is the one who will come to earth a second time to rule before the final judgment. Jesus reveals to him in the, through the scriptures his authority that they asked about in the previous chapter. He is truly God and truly human. And the scripture proves it. And they claim to hold the scriptures true. In the last section, he warns of the failings of those who are in leadership, their selfishness, their greed, and how it affects the people. And we read those things about how what they love and what they like to do that puts them in the limelight, puts them at the, gives them all the, uh, the, the, the approbation of people as, as they look and think, all oh, these people are wonderful. But we also see how their selfishness and greed and how it affects the people. They destroy widows' homes by taking their, their finances. There's lots of other things that we can read through the scriptures of what they do, and you can go through some of these on your own. Some of the other passages in Mark and Luke give further uh, indications of their failures and how it affects the people. In stark contrast, we see this poor widow who comes in and gives the smallest coins possible, but gave her all. She was a pauper in this world, but will be richly rewarded in the next. She gave her all. Comes back to the question, what do I give? How much am I prepared to give? We saw all were silenced before Jesus, and one day all will be silenced in his presence when he returns. In the end, everyone will confess him Lord of all. None will be able to provide any argument. They will all be silenced as he is their judge. The Lord provides answers to all the questions they have, proving from scripture who he is and his authority over all things. There is enough evidence for all to know who Jesus is and why he came. There's enough evidence for what, what he did at Calvary and, where, and his current position in glory. He's waiting for the day his father allows him to return. We may not fully know the scriptures, but let us pray that we don't err in understanding it, its application of it. We will never fully know the power of God, not even in eternity. But we have the scriptures to know he is supreme, he's holy, he's perfect in all things and will do only that which is right. It's enough to rest our confidence in, in this world, in his word. As I thought about these scriptures, we were reminded at the prayer meeting of the need for prayer for those who benefit from the scriptures and the teaching of it and the importance of getting it right. Here is a reminder why we all need to pray for those in, in authority those who lead and may be given the ability they require. Because if the leaders get it wrong, like the children of Israel, the vineyard will, will produce sour grapes. We won't produce the fruit that is required by the landowner. When he comes, we'll be judged. We need to understand the scripture to pray for those and pray for ourselves as we read them, that the Lord will open it up to our eyes and the Spirit will lead us in those things that are, are correct. But it takes time, patience, and trust in God because he has provided what we need in his word. Should we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that uh, through the scriptures he could show his authority. We could show, he could show all those things that uh, would give us the uh, keys to understanding who God is. 
that we might know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, that we might see that God loved us so much that he sent his son. Father, we just pray that as we open your scriptures, that your Holy Spirit would guide us, that we might see and know the Savior as our own, that we might have a closer relationship with the living God, that we might be encouraged to share that with that relationship with others, yeah, that the, the vineyard might grow, that the, the kingdom that is being built uh, on that foundation stone of Christ, the one who errs not, the one who is unmovable, the one who is true, that others might see and come to know him as their own personal Savior. We thank you for our Savior. Father, now we pray as we go into this week, you would take us in safety. Pray for those who are unwell, for those who are struggling. We do ask that you would encourage and, and bless them. Father, now we give you thanks for all those things that you give us day by day uh, for your love. We do pray for our government. We do pray that you uphold them, but that you would strengthen them, that they would make wise decisions in all things. For we ask these in and through our Saviour's precious name, giving thanks. Amen.